So hello and welcome once again. Thank you for joining us for our program at Mechanics Institute Online. We're very pleased to welcome author Susan Meisner for her new book, The Nature of Fragile Things, and also Ron Nyron for his new book, The Book of Lost Light. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events at the Mechanics Institute. Uh, for those of you who are new to our programs, the Mechanics Institute was founded in 1854 and is one of San Francisco's most vital literary and cultural centers in the heart of the city. It features our general interest library, an international chess club, ongoing author and literary programs, and our Friday night cinema lit film series. So please visit our website for all that we offer. Also, the library is now open, so now you can come down and visit us at 57 Post Street, uh, live in person. We're open five days a week, limited hours. Uh, so we're very excited to once again open up the library. Um, our talk today will be followed by a Q&A, so please hold your questions. You can put them in the chat. And I just want to mention that if you'd like to purchase both books, The Nature of Fragile Things by Susan Meisner and The Book of Lost Light by Ron Nyron. Uh, those can be purchased either online uh, or in person at alexanderbook.com or any of your local independent bookstores near you. We are very pleased to welcome these two authors uh, who have novels that tell stories of love, of loss, tangled relationships, and resilience centered around the 1906 earthquake and fire of San Francisco and its aftermath. Uh, and before we begin, I'd like to uh, offer our biographies, our short biographies of our speakers and guests. Susan Meisner is a USA Today best-selling author of historical fiction with more than three quarters of a million books in print in 18 languages. She is an author, speaker, and writing workshop leader with a background in community journalism. Her novels include her recent novel, Not the Nature of Fragile Things, which earned a star review in Publishers Weekly. And also, The Last Year of the War, named to Real Simple Magazine's list of best books of 2019. Also, um, As Bright as Heaven, which earned a star review in Library Journal, and Secrets of Charmed Life, a Goodreads finalist for Best Historical Fiction in 2019, and A Fall of Marigolds, which was also a uh, top of the book list, top, top 10 women's fiction titles in 2014. She is a native of California, and also, um, is a writing workshop volunteer for Words Alive, a San Diego nonprofit dedicated to helping at-risk youth foster a love of reading and writing. And we're very pleased to welcome Susan here for the first time. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure truly to be here. And also our other guest, Ron Nyron's fiction has appeared in the Paris Review, the Missouri Review, the North American Review, Glimmer Train Stories, Mississippi Review, 14 Hills, Able News, Dalhousie Review, 100 Word Story, and in other publications. His stories uh, have been shortlisted for the O. Henry Awards and also for the Pushcart Prize. He is also a co-author with his spouse and writing partner, Sarah Stone, of Deepening Fiction, a practical guide for in intermediate and advanced writers. And he's also a former editor of Furious Fictions, the magazine of short, short stories. I wonder how short they have to be. Um, Ron earned his MFA in creative writing from the University of Michigan, and he is the recipient of a major Hopwood Award, as well as a Farrar Prize in Playwriting and the Roy W. Crowden uh, Memorial Fellowship, as well as the Andrea Beauchamp Prize in Short Fiction. 
He is a fellow, uh, he is a former Stegner fellow, and he also is teaching fiction writing at Stanford University. So please welcome our very accomplished writers and authors and guests. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you so much to you and the Mechanics Institute and Pam for having us here. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to just start off with a few questions. And I'd, I'd like to ask both of you, what drew you to the 1906 earthquake and fire as a, as a catalyst or a centerpiece to both of your novels? And maybe we could start off with Susan. So you're, since you come from afar, from San Diego, uh, what drew you to mm -hmm. writing about San Francisco? That's a great question. Um, it, it's not my first novel. I have written other novels before, and I've always written about far-flung locations, which is wonderful. I've written stories that have taken place in New York and London and parts of Germany, but I've never really written anything that takes place in my home state of California. And I thought, maybe I should be looking at stories that happen right here, where I'm from. Not only because I'm vested in this state, but... Um, the research would be easier, would it not, if I were closer? And definitely in 2020, that was the case, is that it helped to find things to do at home. So I started thinking about, well, what has happened in my home state of California of, of historical significance that hasn't had a whole lot of light thrown on it? And the 1906 earthquake came to mind first because it's a pretty defining moment for California history. And I just didn't see a whole lot of novels that were taking it up as a backdrop. And uh, that interested me um, for, for a lot of different reasons. And you know, one of which was the, um, just the impact on ordinary people. And so when I started doing the deep dive into research, I knew I had a backdrop for a great story. Yeah, I, I think um, I originally was thinking of this story as being set in contemporary times in Connecticut, which is where I grew up. Um, I moved here in the early 90s to the Bay Area, but um, is this going to be a story about a, a boy who grows up being photographed by his father every day as part of some obsessive project to capture time? And I started to ask myself, well, why, what's the significance of this for the father? And I, I thought, well, maybe it would make more sense if, if this were set in the early days of photography. Maybe he's a protege of, of Edward Mybridge, the famous photographer who in Palo Alto in the 1870s first captured the horse in motion and uh, did this pioneering work. Uh, so, so that really led me to think, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna set it in California, which is where I'm going to be, was, was living and also thinking about the historical interesting events of the time. I, you know, as Susan said, the, the San Francisco earthquake is just this fascinating event. Uh, such destruction and such resilience by the refugees and by the uh, rebuilding people rebuilding. So I just really thought that resonated with the themes of, of trying to hold on to time and what happens when we lose just about everything. Um, and, and then started diving into the research and just finding so many treasures. Yes, and I also want to mention that, um, you know, Moybridge uh, has, a, has a very close connection with the Mechanics Institute because he exhibited his, uh, his work at the Mechanics Institute fairs uh, over a course of between 20 years. Mm -hmm. So we found, we just went into our archives in 1857, Moybridge had an exhibition of his books at the fair. And then later on in 1876 at another fair, he exhibited his photos of uh, Central America uh, scenery. And so you, you, he must have had a long relationship with us in, in various ways. So um, that's, that's also really exciting to, to know about, about the, the history that goes into your book and also uh, because it's so compelling with, with Leland Stanford and, and Moybridge and, the, and all of the, the characters, the local characters and um, and persona that that are writ large in our San Francisco history. So that kind of leads me on to my next question: is to I'd like you to both talk about 
uh, your protagonists. And of course, in both books, in, in Ron and your book, there's the father-son relationship and the family relationship uh, that is very entwined. And then, you know, Susan, in your book, you're sort of like this, this kind of accumulation of relationships <laughs> that kind of, it's not, or, it, it's, it, it's not organic because, you know, it's not organic like Ron, the Kylanders. It's, it's sort of a, a mishap <laughs> of relationships. So if you could talk about your protagonist and uh, Ron, since you're here in Berkeley, uh, why don't we start with you? Yeah, well, I started off with this idea of a father photographing his son every day from the boy's birth onward. And, and uh, imagining a young man growing up uh, the center of his father's project, I, I, he admires his father completely as a child and is proud of his part in the work. He is certain that his father is, is making a great contribution the way Edward Mybridge did uh, in documenting the uh, aspects of motion that we can never could see with our eyes before. So he's convinced that this is going to do the same for time. And then as things do, uh, his relationship with his father gets more complicated as Joseph heads into his teen years, uh, develops a crush, uh, starts seeing, uh, there's also in the book, um, Karelia Kylander, Arthur's niece comes down at when uh, Arthur's wife dies in childbirth, giving birth to, to Joseph. So Carelia is sort of a mother figure to Joseph, but she has a very different vision of the world from Arthur. She, Arthur is very uh, orderly, rational, uh, to a fault, um, somewhat rigid in his thinking, although he can also be quite kind. And uh, Carelia is much more passionate and impulsive so Joseph grows up between these two figures, loving both and admiring both, and yet they do not see eye to eye. So, so that also complicates Joseph's uh, view toward, of his father as he grows older and, and sort of starts to share some of Karelia's skepticism about uh, Arthur's more problematic, obsessive traits. And he, he wants more independence. He wants to find, pursue his own path. And he isn't quite sure if his father is a genius or a madman, and yet, they are thrown together by the earthquake uh, and, and they have to look after each other. So I wanted to explore the, the tensions of that, the father and son, both the love and the attachment and the, the desire for a separate self. Great. That sounds so interesting. Yes, my uh, relationships in my novel, as you say, are rather um, convoluted. It's, it's a good way of, I guess, of describing it. But it begins, the story begins with a mail order bride and her name is Sophie. She's living in a terrible tenement situation in lower Manhattan at a time when the tenements were truly terrible in New York. And she wants out for a lot of reasons, not just because she's making pennies a day and living in squalor. And she's telling you the story. And so as, as the first person point of view, as Sophie is relaying her story to you, the reader, it's obvious that there are things about her past that she's keeping buried and she's not quite honest with you, but she's honest about not being honest. There are things that are wanting her, um, there are things about New York that want her to get out. And so when she sees a mail order bride ad for a widower in San Francisco who wants a new wife for himself and a new mother for his five-year-old girl, she um, answers the ad and he accepts her and sends her a train ticket and she takes the train out to Oakland, gets off the train, gets on that ferry and she um, you know, ends up in the ferry building, meets him for the first time and they go straight to the courthouse and she marries him. And she's, you know, at first she's um, quite content because she has about 90% of everything that she's wanted. She's got a nice place to live. They live in a nice um, um, house near Russian Hill, it's very pretty. Um, he's got, um, you know, he's, he's nice, he's, he's kind in a way, he's um, able to provide, he's a very good provider, and she's got this little girl to love, and she thought she would never have a child to love, because she already knows that she can't have children, and she's out of New York, and so for all of these reasons, she feels like she's quite content, but there's just one little niggling thing, and that is that there's something up with her new husband, and she can't quite figure out what it is, but he's slightly aloof, 
he doesn't quite, she can tell he's not quite transparent with her, but she decides to dismiss it because she has 90% of everything that she's long wanted. And uh, mainly because she's falling in, the, in love with his little girl who does not speak by the way. And that's attributed to the fact that she's grieving the loss of her mother. And she's able to dismiss it until a certain day in April, 1906, when everything starts to come crashing down around her. And I mean, everything, and you know, of course, what happens is everything begins to fall apart figuratively and literally um, in, in April, 1906. Yes, well, thanks for that, for the, both of those descriptions and to kind of set, set the scene for us. So I think the next thing is we, we'd love to hear uh, you read from, from your works. And uh, since you already whet our appetite, uh, we'd love you both to, to read from, from your new books. Uh, Susan, would you like to go first? Sure. Well, I'm going to start kind of in the middle. It's not true middle, but I thought I would start with a scene that actually takes place in the Mechanics Pavilion, which, as many of you probably know, was destroyed in the 1906 quake and fire. And so I'm gonna, I, need, I need to give you a little bit of background information for you to appreciate what's happening in the scene. So the quake has just happened. It, you know, it happened at five, a little after five in the morning and they've left their home on Russian Hill because it's not stay, safe to stay. They're making their way to the hospital in that beautiful courthouse structure that unfortunately also did not survive. It's still standing as they're making their way down the hill because with Sophie is a woman who is in labor and she's helping this woman um, get down to the hospital, which was in the basement of that old beautiful county courthouse and city structure. And so they get to, they get to the, you know, the courthouse structure where, this, where the hospital is underneath in the basement and, and all the patients are being evacuated out of it because it's not safe. All the columns have fallen. The building is pretty much already starting to fall into ruin because of the quake. And they're moving everybody into the mechanics pavilion. So it's Sophie and this woman named Belinda who's in labor. Of course, she has to go into labor on minutes after the quake. And with, with them both is Kat, Catherine, who is this little girl who does not speak, who Sophie um, is now stepmother to and very, very much attached to. And so um, it's a little after eight in the morning, nine in the morning. I think perhaps by this time, um, it's, it's a little after noon when this, when this particular scene starts and the baby has already been born in the mechanics pavilion, which you might know was like an arena. And the night before there had been a roller derby the night before. And so if you can picture like a rodeo grounds or any other type of um, like where, where a circus might be held, that's what it was like. And so she gave birth on the floor of, of the pavilion with other women holding up blankets for privacy. So the baby has just been born. It's a little afternoon in the afternoon and the story then begins. And so this is Sophie speaking um, and she's looking down at this beautiful baby that's sort of like um, a reminder that life is precious and life is resilient because in the midst of all this chaos, and um, I, I might add that the pavilion was not only the evacuation site for people coming out of that basement hospital, but people were being brought to it with injuries from all over um, that part of San Francisco. And so the inside of the pavilion at this point is quite chaotic with many wounded coming in. Um, and then of course, people trying to um, evacuate from the damage from the quake. And Sophie says, the moment is as perfectly beautiful as a moment can be. I want it to last forever. And for five or 10 blessed minutes, it seems like it just might. But then a shout rings out across the sea of mattresses, across the masses of dead and living. The roof of the pavilion is on fire. The nurse who helped Belinda earlier has returned and with her are a policeman and three sisters of charity in starched black habits streaked with dust. The nurse is speaking to us in a falsely calm voice. I can see that she is concerned with the enormous task of transporting so many people out of harm's way. There must be four or 500 injured in the pavilion now. I help Belinda to her feet while the nurse and the others assist the other women in our little group of mattresses. Belinda seems unable to comprehend what is happening. Her face is void of expression, but her eyes tell me she can't believe that again, we are fleeing danger. 
She's also weak from childbearing and not having eaten enough, and she begins to collapse seconds after she stands. One of the sisters reaches for Belinda's baby, and Belinda shouts for me to take her. The sister obliges and hands me the child. A policeman sweeps Belinda up in his arms and begins to head to the exit. With the sleeping baby and cat to attend to, I make the quick decision to abandon my travel case. Hold my skirt, cat, I tell her, don't let go. Cat looks up at me with fear-filled eyes but obeys. We race to follow the policeman who is carrying Belinda. We emerge onto the street and into an orange gold world of smoke and ash. Above us, hundreds of firefly cinders from an approaching blaze we can't yet see are alighting on the roof of the pavilion, which is already heartily aflame in several places. I can't see the other fires. The air all around us is a smoldering blanket obscuring everything but what is right in front of me. But I can smell them, feel them, taste them, hear them. Ashes swirl about the ruin of the city hall across the street like snow. Automobiles and wagons and trucks, every kind of vehicle that can be pressed into service has been. These are now being loaded with not just the wounded, but the bodies of the dead from the pavilion. We are told we will be taking refuge at Golden Gate Park, two miles away. Belinda is placed in a laundry delivery truck along with several other female patients in various stages of ability and health. When Kat and I and the baby reach the back of the truck, we are told we have to find our own way to the park. There is only room for the wounded and sick in the commandeered vehicles. Don't leave me, Belinda cries out as I hand the baby to a man helping the women get situated inside the truck. The man hands the infant to Belinda as she begs again for me not to leave her. We'll find you at the park, I promise, I call to her. The door is shut on Belinda and my last view of her is her shouting that she wants out of the truck. Another man raps on the vehicle to alert the driver to get moving. I can't tell which direction is west. The sun is masked by smoke. I can only follow the trucks and autos and carriages and the masses of people doing the same. No one is heading east to the ferries now. I hear someone ask why the fire brigades are not putting the fires out. And someone else says they have been trying all morning to put them out, but the earthquake broke all the water mains below ground. The firemen can access no water. It is nearly laughable that as I hear these words, we are marching west on a peninsula that is surrounded on three sides by the sea. There is water in every direction, but one, but no way of getting it to the streets. Those who had put out the fires can only do, can only do, can, can do little more than watch them take what they want. And then I hear a boom off in the distance and then another. The fire has gotten a hold of something explosive, I'm thinking. But a man in the military uniform several yards away says the army is dynamiting buildings here and there to create fire breaks and hopefully starve the fire of its food. I look away from the direction of the neighborhoods near Russian Hill and urge Kat to quicken her steps if she can. She and I have taken long walks before. I know she can manage a two mile walk, but Kat tires after the first mile. It is no ordinary stroll we are on. Everything about it is wrong. A man fleeing with his own family of much older children offers to carry her and I don't even ask Kat if she yells all right. If that is all right, I just let him scoop her up and we continue our trek away from the fires and toward the sand hills surrounding the park. So I hope that was enough of a read for you. Was that, was that enough for everyone? Yes, okay, Great. good. Thank you. Oh, Susan, I was just getting, I was just getting chills recalling uh, as you were reading the scene in, in the inside of the pavilion, because, you know, we, we have the, all these articles and we have documentation, but to actually bring it to life with the characters and what would, was, was going on in there. Uh, the pavilion is the building, uh, it is in the location of the, the Graham Auditorium mm -hmm. um, opposite City Hall. It was the site of this incredibly huge fair and then it was transformed immediately into a hospital, sort of a, a makeshift hospital. But a lot of tragedy uh, came out of out of that because it did burn down. And um, they tried to save as many people as possible. But there, it's a very tragic situation all, all around. All right, thank you, Susan. And um, now we'd we'll love to hear from Ron. Thank you. That was that was really amazing. I I love that passage. 
Um, I'm going to read a passage that comes six days after the earthquake when Joseph, uh, who's about 15 years old at this time, and his father and his cousin Karelia have fled the city. Their home has been lost to the flames, they believe. And I was just, I was fascinated by the, all the stories of the many refugees who fled to Berkeley and Oakland and other cities around the Bay uh, who hadn't, cities that hadn't suffered as much damage and who took in so many refugees in their attics and basements and in their backyards, spare lots. Um, just so much, so much generosity from fa to family members, but also to complete strangers. And so uh, Arthur, my photographer, has a wealthy patron called Thomas Hallgarten. He's sort of his version of Governor Stanford, who lives in the Berkeley Hills. So Arthur, and they have a complicated relationship with, with Mr. Hallgarten at this point, as you as you do with patrons sometimes. Um, but they, if Arthur is determined to, to go across the bay to the Hall Gardens. And so they are sharing tents in the backyard in the Berkeley Hills with some other artists who have been refugees and who have found a patron in Mr. Hall Garden. So uh, this is a little taste of refugee life. Uh, all you need to know about this scene is that Joseph is sitting on a balcony with Thomasine, Mr. Hall Garden's daughter, who is about the same age as he is. Thomasine seemed content to sit with me and so we stared at the city across the bay as its blackened ruin slowly disappeared in the twilight. I leaned closer to her, as if to get a better look at the city, but it was her profile that I studied. How had I not seen before how beautiful she was? I was trying to formulate some sort of compliment about her eyelashes when a noise came from the yard below. A figure approached the house, moving uncertainly, tracking back and forth. A man I didn't recognize. He stopped, swayed, and fell. Mama, Thomasine cried, bolting into the living room. I followed her down the stairs and out the door. Thomasine leaned over the man, lying with his face in the grass, and turned him over. His eyes were closed. He wore a long greatcoat with a singed hole in the front, large enough to put a hand through. His hat had fallen off, revealing a considerable mass of long black hair. Mud caked his shoes and trousers, and the reek of earth and whiskey came off him. Thomasine ran into the house. I thought to get her mother, but instead she returned carrying a vase of flowers. She yanked out the bouquet and upended the water over his face. I admired her quick thinking. He sputtered and gave a shout, half rising on one elbow. A flower stem, blackened and flattened by rot, clung to his stubbled cheek. He wiped his face and looked around, groggy. After a moment, he extended his fingers toward Thomasine. She set the vase down as if she thought he wanted her help getting up, but instead he grasped the flowers by their heads. She let go and their stems reluctantly released from her palm. You need to get that hand looked after, darling, he said. She held up her palm in the moonlight. Beads of blood appeared where thorns had dug in. I didn't notice they were roses, she said. Mrs. Hallgarten came out and sent Thomasine back into the house, eyeing the vase as if the man had been caught thieving. I explained what had happened, irritated to have my moment with Thomasine broken. You smell of whiskey, Mrs. Hallgarten told the man. He struggled to his feet. My name is Nicholas Forrester, he said, and the whiskey is, in this case, more medicinal than diversionary. He lifted his hands in the air, showing us they were scraped and swollen. Under, Mr. Hallgar under Mrs. Hallgarten's scrutiny, he seemed to sober up. He said that he'd crossed to Berkeley on Friday and spent a damp night in the university baseball field, jammed in a small tent with five Scotsmen. He'd come across the newspaper's list of refugees staying in Berkeley and saw his friends, the Vissers and the Crowleys, were at the Hallgartens. Before he could leave, soldiers commandeered him to help them dig latrines for the camp. Three hours later, they let him go, and the Scots shared some of their whiskey. I'm sorry to have collapsed the exhaustion on your lawn, Nicholas said, and I'm grateful to the girl for the dash of fetid water to the face. Mrs. Hallgarden sent me to fetch Peter Visser, who expressed delight to see him. He's an actor, Peter told her. You have to forgive him if he can't help making a dramatic entrance. 
After he had settled around the bonfire, Peter and Sebastian bombarded him with questions. First, Nicholas asked for a basin of water into which he plunged his head, holding back his long dark hair with one hand. I had thought him older, but now, clean-faced, he appeared to be in his late twenties. Ina poured him a cup of cold coffee and sliced him some bread. Nicholas told us his story between mouthfuls. The morning of the earthquake, he had been writing a letter for reasons he couldn't recall. Then all his furniture jerked about and snow fell. I said to myself, I can't be that drunk. But the snow turned out to be flakes of ceiling plaster. He flung himself under his desk. A tremendous ripping noise came, followed by silence. When I looked out, he said, one wall had vanished and my bed had slid right out like a biscuit from a tin. It landed on a pile of bricks, three stories below. I'll stop there. Great, thank you, thank you, Ron, for bringing us into the into into Berkeley and as a place of refuge. And um, I'm just, you know, very so impressed with how the your your writing style for both of you is so descriptive. It's so it's it's both personal and bringing the personal into the historic. That that wonderful compliment uh, is really a delight, and it's a delight in both books. And so I'd like to also ask both of you about what effect the disaster has on the characters and the plot as you go along. Um, and if you could comment on that and how, the, how that influenced you and also influences the characters and, and the structure of, of both um, your works. Ron, do you wanna start? Sure. My characters lose just about everything in the earthquake and fire. And Arthur, who has been taking a photograph of Joseph every day uh, from four sides uh, since Joseph was bo practically born, he, he's lost, he believes he, he's lost uh, all of his negatives and prints from this project that he's been planning to take public uh, for, for so many years. And so it's it's devastating to him. He has is having a hard time letting go. And at the same time, Joseph and his older cousin Corelia are finding themselves in a community of artists, and it's it's like a, a lifeline in some ways to them. They've both been previously just revolving around Arthur and his vision. Uh, Corelia has been working as a receptionist in Arthur's photographic studio and Joseph has been trying to live up to his father's vision. And now there are all these wild artists, painters, actor, who uh, are, have been leaving the, leaving the bohemian life in San Francisco. And their stories and their, their merriment um, really open up new doors for both Joseph and Karelia. And uh, they, the artists end up putting on amateur theatricals in the backyard to keep their spirits up and the spirits of other refugees. And Joseph starts acting and finding that is sort of his, feels like his true vocation to be able to not just be in front of the camera for his father, but to be enacting stories, which is his true passion. And Karelia is, is also pursuing her own photographic vision very different from Arthur's. So, because I was just struck by all the stories of the refugees not just the terrible losses, but also the resilience, the, the ways they, you know, you would, people would walk through the camps at night in San Francisco and elsewhere and just there would be the sound of guitars and mandolins and people making life uh, anew in, in a way uh, to, despite the thumbing their nose in some ways at, at all the destruction and devastation. And I just love that. So even with a terrible loss, there's that possibility for for reinvention and rebirth. That's great. Yeah, with my characters, with Sophie in particular, you know, she was able to distance herself from what she didn't want to see because she had 90% of what she wanted. And um, sometimes we need something big, a big catalyst for us to deal with reality. And that's what the earthquake was for her because not only did it um, affect her physical living situation, um, but she was no longer able to ignore 
her situation with this man that she married. And I won't tell you why, because I don't want to spoil it for anybody who might want to read the book. But, you know, as she and her stepdaughter and this woman named Belinda, as they're fleeing the ruin of her home, and this woman Belinda is in labor, um, it, it's, it's, it's setting off more than just um, fleeing away from, from danger, from the quake and the, um, the fire that is coming. But she's also running now from other dangers too, which when you, when you read the book, you'll understand. The quake and the fire, um, what they did to San Francisco, and maybe you've seen the picture, but there's a very telling picture. It's taken from, I believe, a dirigible, and it's an aerial view three days afterward. And it just shows the wasteland of downtown San Francisco, you know, the 500 city blocks. And all you can see are the skeletal remains of that beautiful city hall structure that took 26 years to build at an astronomical cost of 6 million. And there's basically nothing left of it, but its skeleton and everything around it is gone. It kind of, it laid bare everything. And so I use that imagery for Sophie now because she can no longer ignore what she wants to ignore. Everything's been laid bare. She has to move, she has to act. She can't pretend that she doesn't see what she doesn't wanna see, especially if she wants to protect this little girl who she loves as if, you know, if Kat were her own daughter. So the, the earthquake and the fire, um, both, uh, both of them together act as both a catalyst to force her into action. She has to start making decisions. And then it also lays bare her situation so that it's, um, she can't ignore it any longer. And I, I like that imagery. And I like the idea that, you know, all of us experience times in our life where it feels like your world is falling apart. You know, 2020 was that way for almost all of us. Um, some of us um, to a higher degree than others, but we all felt the instability of what we always thought of as um, our, just the basics of, of life. Everything was unstable last year. And for some people, um, far, far worse than others. And so it's at those times when it feels like your world is caving in, crashing in around you, that you have to rise up. Because um, if there's one thing you cannot do when your world is caving in, is you, you can't just stand there. And so you know, it forces you into action. And a really good book, I think if you think of all the novels that you've liked, um, loved, it's because the character was forced into action and they had to start making choices. And those choices had, there were stakes involved. You know, if they didn't, if they didn't do something, something would happen. And the more I used that imagery, the more I was able to, I hope, craft a story that shows you that Sophie, um, after the quake and fire, she can no longer just stand there and do nothing. She must make decisions. She must act. Oh, I love this idea of, you know, through this disaster and also exactly how it parallels our experience today, you know, what is what is lost, what is exposed, what is left, um, and also what is created or what what motivates us to to take next steps or or take action. I think there's very, very powerful themes and it's so close to us right now. Um, also, you know, I wanted to ask about your research. If if you could say anything about things that you discovered that were shocking or interesting or unusual um, about this pivotal time in San Francisco, uh, and also with the reinvention of the city or the necessity to have a reinvention of the city or to go to places like to create in Berkeley and, and to live in other places. So anything that just was, that was outstanding for you uh, in your research or surprising? Um, yeah, well, just to follow up on what Susan was saying. I was just really uh, impressed and, and, and made, just made happy by the, or by or inspired by the resilience of the citizens of San Francisco and the surrounding communities in the time of disaster. And it was just really helpful to have those stories in my head as we went through this particular, uh, the, at the height of the pandemic, just everything seemed so unstable, as Susan said. And it helped to, to be remembering these stories of the, of the generosity 
um, and the, even the spirit of insouciance that, that sort of kept them going, the, the little bits of doggerel that I came across, the historic uh, things that people scrawled on walls. Um, the number of wedding licenses jumped uh, sharply in April and May. There were all these, they call them earthquake weddings. Um, there's this really wonderful description in an old Sunset Magazine article about a wedding that by you know, a fairly well-to-do couple that everyone was dressed in whatever they had. Um, and by, you know, there was, there was no place to get buy a wedding present for the couple. So guests would brought molten bits of jewelry or plates that they had dug from the ruins of their burned homes uh, or their sort of earthquake souvenirs to give. Because um, there were no shops, there were no banks open. Uh, they had to borrow all the glasses and all the wine because uh, apparently soldiers had looted the hostess's uh, wine cellars and pantries. Um, so it's just, just the kind of uh, inventiveness of sort of dealing with that and the determination to, mm -hmm. to, to carry on. Um, and I also just wanted to mention the, the city had this massive rebuilding effort that took many years and they held this Great World's Fair in 1915, the Panama Pacific International Exposition which was their way of saying, you know, look, we're back. We're, you know, look, and they had huge pavilions of dedicated to agriculture and uh, horticulture and art and science and industry, just showing off so much to the world uh, from global, you know, many countries participated in creative pavilions. And it was just this glorious thing that stretched through almost all of 1915. So I, I ended the book, uh, with with the with the 1915 exposition, uh, some scenes there because I just felt it was a really great way to to convey that spirit of you know we're going to build back and uh, create this glorious way of, of celebrating our own resilience. Yeah, and of course you have to also know for those for those of you who who don't know about our Mechanics Institute history, our building at 57 Post Street. Uh, was completely destroyed um, in the firing quake. And so um, we, we have our new building, which was opened in 1910. Uh, so we had to do a lot of recreating of the Mechanics Institute along the way. So thank you, Ron, for, for mentioning that. And also, I wanna also make that connection too, that our uh, president of mechanics um, and a lot of the staff were very involved in the 1915, the planning and the organizing of the 1915 Pan Pacific Fair. Uh, so it was it was so important to San Francisco history, rebuilding and reclaiming its place in in this country and also in the world, uh, because it was an international event of great importance. Uh, but anyway, thank you for, for bringing that uh, to our attention. Um, I just feel we're, we're, both books are just, we're just so in the middle, in the middle of, of the, sto the storylines of, of each of your, of your novels. Anyway, yes, let's hear from Susan. Yeah, I was, I was impressed by the exact same thing, really, the, the resiliency and that moxie and determination to rebuild. Um, also to the generosity of the rest of the world, um, I remember reading um, a list of all the different um, monetary gifts that were sent to San Francisco and also tangible things. I think Oregon sent um, several train cars full of provisions. Um, they sent doctors and nurses. Chicago sent meat, Minneapolis sent flour. The Rockefellers wrote a check. I just, I, I liked hearing the stories of the nation, you know, coming around a sister city and doing what they could to help. But the resilience of the San Franciscans uh, is truly um, amazing. And I, I mentioned uh, to the, um, the, the exposition when I talk about this book and, and the rebuilding of the city that in only nine years, they were able to hold the World's Fair is really phenomenal. And if you wanna, like when we're done here tonight and you get off of this Zoom call, go onto your Google search engine and just search for images of the 1915 World's Fair in San Francisco, the buildings that were built are just amazingly beautiful. They're beautiful. And if I'm not mistaken, they were built on landfill and the landfill was the, the detritus of the city that had been destroyed. You know, so they trucked all that, 
all the, the, um, the, the ash and the broken buildings and the crumbling stone, they trucked it all north up to the marina area and they dumped it, made landfill. And then they, they built the exposition, exposition on really what had been left of the city. So it's, I don't know, it's kind of poignant to me that that's what happened. And the buildings truly are, they're just remarkable. It's amazing to me that that, that, that could happen in only nine years. I think it takes tremendous determination to pull that off. And it was, it's just nice to see too that um, people are willing to rebuild what was taken in the place that it was taken. You know, lots and lots of buildings rebuilt where they fell. And when I you know, think of the Palace Hotel, it, it may be scooched over a block, but it's pretty much in the same place where it was before. And I just, I don't know, that just seems to me to be, it's just remarkable. And uh, when, I, when I think of this city now, and what it went through a hundred some years ago, I, I think there's a lesson to be learned about not letting um, not letting d devastation keep you in despair, you know. But to you know recognize the loss, mourn the loss, but then but then find a way to move on and and um, move out. And that that to me was particularly remarkable. Yes, great. Thank you, Susan. Uh, I think we'll open this to the audience Q&A. So Pam, if you'd like to come on board here and uh, Pam Troy, our events assistant is gonna read off a few of the questions. Well, the first question is from Sharon Stone. Susan and Ron, I love the ways you both have these large, wonderful casts of characters. Did you have any particular challenges in managing them or surprising discoveries as you were writing? Well, I can start with that one, I guess. Um, this book actually took me three tries. <laughs> and my first set of characters, with, um, I wrote 25,000 words and it wasn't going anywhere. I could tell, I just, the story was, it was not, I, I could tell that if I kept going with the characters I had, that I was gonna end up disappointed. And, and it was actually my editor who pointed out to me that I the story was going nowhere. So I started again, this time with these characters read in this book. And even again, with that second try, I wrote 50,000 words before I realized I still don't have it right. And it was because I was trying to involve all the characters so that the, the different female characters in this book, I was giving them all chapters and they were all able to tell the story. And it was when I realized that this was the only story to tell, that I finally dialed into the story and got in the groove and I just made it her. So it's Sophie telling you the story in first person so everything she wants you to know, she tells you. And everything she doesn't want you to know, she puts back. And um, so it was it was helpful, I guess, to have those false starts because I didn't really realize who the story belonged to until I had those false starts and realized it was only Sophie's story to tell. That's, that makes me feel better, um, Susan, because I also went through experience of I, in my case, I just kept bringing in more and more characters, and the number of characters I've cut from this book could probably fill in another novel with the same number of characters, because uh, just I was fascinated by so many artists at the time period that I wanted to, there were cameo appearances that I thought, oh, I've just got to put this person in, and, uh, and people inspired by artists and behemians of the time, and they just didn't make the story go, um, so I had to had to prune them and and find the story and I kept you know as I was in the latter stages of rewriting this novel I just imagined my three primary characters Joseph Arthur and Karelia and I imagined myself throwing a lasso around them and, and pulling them closer together because you know they wanted to go off in their own directions and and the tension came from from being still being tied to each other and dependent on each other in some ways so um, so that kind of helped me focus um, and then whatever other characters I needed to help them tell their story. That's great. I love that. Re remember writers who are out there get a lasso your characters in. That's great and visceral advice. And uh, and Susan, yes, just the who the voice wh whose voice is really telling the story is so important. And and it's it's a, it, sometimes that's a, that's the biggest discovery uh, as as you've indicated. Um, all right, we'll continue. Uh, a couple more questions. Yes, the next one is from Zoe Heimdall. Thanks to you both for sharing. 
how do you know when to stop researching the historic details? Even though I know a lot about the San Francisco history, I feel so nervous to decide whether I've researched enough, but that I'd still have inaccuracies based on things I'd never thought to research or assumptions I'd made. Well, for me, I set a date to start because if I did set a date to start writing, I would never start writing because research is fun and writing is hard. And so for this particular book, I remember I set a date on my calendar for June 1 and I wrote it down on my desk calendar and I wrote it down in my phone that this is the day I begin, no matter how I feel about how much I've researched, because the truth be told, you'll never feel like you, you know it all. So you have to begin at some point. And the other thing is, is that it's only as you're writing, at least for me, it was only as I was writing that I realized what I still didn't know, like what I lacked. And some of the research that I had done, I didn't need at all. And I didn't know that until I started writing. So I would say, you know, be, feel, feel pretty good about where you're beginning. Like do, do your work. Um, for me, it takes about four or five months where I'm just researching. I don't do anything else. I'm not writing anything. I'm only reading and taking notes. But then I have to start. And then once I start, that's when I begin to realize what I still don't know and need to know and what I can really just let go of. Yeah, that's great advice. I, I gave myself a year because this was my first novel. I just gave myself a year to take notes and research and try to figure out what I might need. And even then I couldn't, but, uh, but after a year, I was like, okay, I got to start writing because otherwise I'll never, never know enough. Um, and, and along the way, the story took turns and I was like, oh, well now I have to research this. Um, and and it, the research inspired a lot of my story when I would come across things uh, for good and for bad, the wrong turns as well as the, eventual right turns so but yeah you, you can never know enough and knowing that you know maybe there's some scholars out there who will be reading our books and saying well that actually happened on you know september 6th not september 5th but, you know but the important thing is that the story is told you try you do your best and the main thing is the story and does it does it ring emotionally true does it um does it convey the spirit of the times? Uh, that in a, in a certain way is more important for a novel. I can't imagine how historians do it, but, but uh, ask them when the next time a historian talks about writing their books. Well, there's this, this kind of, the second, this next question is from Emily Sellers and it's kind of, it's, it's similar. Great readings, I look forward to driving into your novel. I'm curious about how you balanced research with writing. Did you do all your research into the history of in the quake first and then launch into developing your story and characters? Or did you find yourself doing a bit of both as you developed your drafts? It must have been difficult to rein in your desire to know more about the quake and its aftermath. And I guess um, one thing I'd add to that is when you were, you know, it sounds as though you did research while you were writing, you'd come up on something, but did you basically just stop writing while you researched or did you, did you try writing? Did you write a draft and then do your research and then go back and, and possibly amend things? Um, I, I would, wouldn't really, st I mean, I might stop for a day or two, but, uh, but I wanted to keep up the momentum. And at the point that I was in the middle of the novel, I, I sort of knew enough that it was just filling in details for the most part. One thing that the, the 1915 exposition I had read a little bit about, but it wasn't until quite many drafts into it that I, very, very late in the novel's development that I put that in. Um, and, and really started to research it in earnest. Uh, and, if, and if there's people who are interested in uh, learning more about it, there's this great book by Laura Ackley called, I think San Francisco's Jewel City. Beautiful book, which also has lots of pictures and information. And, uh, and that one I had just come out, I think when I started doing the 1915 part of the book, uh, and that was perfect timing. So yeah, there's serendipity along the way and uh, and great research first sometimes at the end when you need it most. Yeah, for me, I don't do a lot of writing when I'm researching. I feel like when I'm researching, I am filling my cupboards with groceries. So it's like shopping and I'm, I'm building the, the, the pantry, if you will, so that when I start writing, I don't have to go out and go shopping. I have everything that I need to write the book, my full pantry. 
And so I, I um, read as much as I can. This is the book I recommend. It's Simon Winchester is a crack at the end of the world. This book I think I read three times just to prepare my, um, my head for the, for the logistics of what happened. And so um, that book I recommend if you wanna know what was it like scientifically and logistically and all of that. And then this book was invaluable to me. It's called Three Fearful Days. And what this man has done, his name is Malcolm Barker, is he went to all the different newspapers and libraries and historical societies and he gathered all of these firsthand accounts. So the whole book are just excerpts of firsthand accounts because while Simon Winchester's amazing book told me what it was like, um, this book of all these excerpts of firsthand accounts told me this is what it felt like. This is what it, it smelled like and how, how it looked because these are people that actually lived through it. So I think having both of those types of books is very helpful to research, for your research. And then of course, once you start writing, I think you'll, you'll figure out what you need to know more of. And sometimes you won't know what you'll need more of until you start writing. I have a, just a, one quick question. Um, as historical writers, um, what is it you think people often miss when they're researching an era? when they're trying to write believably about an era, are there things, I mean, a lot of times everyone knows, well, you need to get the clothes right, you need to get the science right, but what are things that people often overlook when they're writing historical fiction and uh, that, that might just slip by their awareness of mm -hmm. what needs to be researched or what they need to have a handle on? It's a great question. I think for me, I, I want to pay particular attention to what does the culture value uh, because values change and what, what a society deems as important changes. And it's, um, it's, it can be easy to drop in, you know, colloquialism that wouldn't fit and um, to have things happening that are just anachronistic to the point where they take your reader out of the historical moment and you know, you're, you're trying to be as accurate as you can while still using language that people actually use today to tell the story. But I think if, if you really wanna pay attention to what people cared about is to, um, like for me, I went to the public library downtown in San Francisco, got my library card, and then was able to avail myself of newspapers from, from every, every day, like um, daily looks at the newspaper because the newspaper is the day-to-day -day life of the city and you can tell what people care about by reading the front page, by reading the society page, by reading the opinion page. You can you can tell what people are thinking about because it's the it's the it's the um, it's the language of the day, the local and daily newspaper. So I would say, no matter what era you're writing, if they have a newspaper, if you can access the digital archives, it's worth it to become a member of that place's library. You can tell yourself of historical digital digitized newspapers. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that. And uh, the newspapers were so helpful. I, I went to the Berkeley Historical Society and uh, they very kindly got down their old editions of the Berkeley Gazette from, from 1906. And I just paged through day by day for, for many days just to get an experiment. Okay, in a, a sense of what it was like uh, when you don't know what's coming next because you know, any given day you're you're right there with them. They don't know what's going to be happening, what they're going to find. And so having that lived experience really helped me get a sense of, of how they thought and, and yeah, what, like you said, what they valued. Great. Um, just jumping off from what you were saying, Ron, about uh, Laura Ackley's book, which is really stunning. Um, one of our members, Lee Bruno, also wrote about the, um, the 1915 uh, Pan Pacific, it's called Panorama, uh, Tales from San Francisco's 1915 Pan Pacific International Exhibition. And so both of those books are tremendous resources if you want to get into the history of, uh, of the exposition. Really wonderful with incredible photos as well. Um, I have a couple more questions. Actually, what I want to ask you is if you would like to query each other about each other's works. Well, I, I was just totally gripped, Susan, by your novel and just just swept along with it. And I I was just curious to know how you weave 
plot and history because you know you have this fixed event, uh, the earthquake, which where you found out what exactly happened, and yet you were you were able to weave your character's story into it so seamlessly uh, with the, the the story of their lives that was unfolding uh, so urgently for them. So I'm just curious, how do you how do you get them to to weave together so so seamlessly? Oh, thank you very much. I think for me, what I try to do is. And this is how I dialed back into the heart of the story after those two false starts was I just got back to the basics of story, which is really, you know, every, every good story is about a character who wants something. They don't have it. They go after it and they meet obstacles along the way. If you think of, you know, Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz, she wants to get back home. She can't get back home without seeing the wizard. And so she has to go to the wizard to be able to get back home. So we know what she wants. We know why she wants it. And all along the way, she's meeting obstacles that get worse and worse and worse. So for me, when I put a character in a historical setting as rich as this one, I still have to give Sophie something to want. And it's gotta be more than just surviving the quake and fire. It has to be more. And so, um, you know, thinking about what my character wants, it can be um, a day long, week long, month long search to figure out, well, what does she want? And why does she want it? And what obstacles is she going to meet along the way? And how am I going to be able to surprise the reader um, along the way too? Because um, you know, tension is what the story, and nothing, nothing is as tense as being um, throwing a twist or a turn in the story that the reader didn't see coming. So th that's the main thing I, I try to focus on: is what what does the character want, and why do they want it, and why don't they have it? And, and the more I can dial into like a universal need, um, the more I hope that readers of all ages will be able to empathize with my character because if, if they either want the same thing or they know somebody who does, they'll be able to emotionally connect with that desire. And, and hopefully I, I can do that on the page, but thank you very much. I was gonna ask you, how has your MFA helped you in your journey as a novelist, because I don't have one. And I've always wondered, like, what, what does an MFA do? Does it open up new worlds to you? Did it, did it open up your imagination in places you never dreamed of before? Oh, thank you. That's a great, great question. I think in some ways it required me to uh, enlarge what I was doing. I came into the MFA writing, you know, I have been writing for a number of years quite seriously, but being around other people with different aesthetics and different stories to tell. Uh, you know, you look around the room and you're like, oh, okay, wow, this person is talking about this and I'm just writing a story about uh, some teenagers hurt feelings. Um, I, I got off my game. Um, I, wow, this person's language is just so, uh, you know, so tight, so full of imagery that makes me want to up my game in that direction too. So just being exposed and just being exposed to their passions, the, the people they read and loved and who inspired them and encountering so much, so many writers that they loved, that they had that, that had stuff to teach me too. Um, so it was this really great diversification and, and challenge and uh, inspiration for me. Great. Wonderful. And just to wrap up, I would, since both of you are both writers and teachers and uh, workshop leaders, um, just to leave us with a, you know, what from your own experience do you like to guide writers towards? Well, I always tell young writers because that's who I, if I'm going to be in a position where I'm able to impart any kind of knowledge, it's usually with, with young writers. I'm talking children, teenagers is um, I tell them that writing is like any other exercise, like swimming, for example. You don't get better at it by wanting to be better. You just have to swim. The more you swim, the better you'll get at it. And it's, a, it's like a muscle that when you work it, it gets stronger. The more you work it, the stronger it will get. And if you think of Olympic swimmers, and we're gonna be seeing some because the Olympics are starting tomorrow, is you know that swimmers like Michael Phelps he didn't just start out winning gold medals. He swam a lot of laps in a pool where no one was watching and he got stronger and better each time he did. 
And writing is that way too. You start out by just exercising in the pool <laughs> when no one is watching. So it means really just exercising your writing muscle every day, find something to write about every day. There's always a prompt you can find on the internet that allows you just to put your thoughts down on paper because even if you feel like I have nothing important to say today, um, still write, write anyway. And maybe the lap you do in the pool that day isn't that great, but you still exercise the muscle. And every day you do that, you will get better. Yeah, that's great advice. Uh, and I think I also, maybe because of my experience in the MFA program, I, I did also just urge people to read widely, um, read books that are being published now and books that were published decades ago, centuries ago. Uh, from other countries in translation, uh, outside the genre that you usually read, poetry, nonfiction, inspiration can come from everywhere. And I remember a story that one of my teachers, uh, Eileen Pollock, uh, in my MFA program, told us was that when she was in college taking her first creative writing course, she was going to be a science major. Um, but she took a course where the professor taught a story by Grace Paley, and uh, Eileen had never see, read a story narrated by a New York, you know, a Jewish New York voice with all that, that humor and insight. And she was like, you can tell a story like this. Um, and I feel like the more we read, the more we come across these liberating examples. We're like, oh, a story can be that. You know, I, I had never guessed that. You, you find the thing that really opens you up in a way and lets you do something that you didn't know was possible. Wonderful. Well, I want to thank our our inspiring guests and writers. Um, both books are really gorgeous. So please everyone get to your bookstore or online or wherever and um, please enjoy these two wonderful new novels. Um, I wanna thank Ron Nyron and Susan Meisner for a, a wonderful conversation about the art of writing and your new works. And we look forward to having you back. So thank you, everyone, and we will see you very soon, either on Zoom or alive in person. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, for, thanks, everybody. Thank you.